All right, everyone, welcome to the very first episode of Peter and Code. My name is Peter Ulrich and I'm a software developer from Germany. I've been working with Elixir for almost two years now and with Python before that. So I started this channel as a 2021 project um, for me to just uh, gather my thoughts on things that I'm learning currently. And also I would like to share these thoughts and learnings and experiences with you uh, in the Elixir and general software development community. Today, I would like to talk about the very first library that I've been recently started, that I have recently started to use, which is called Cloak Acto. I don't know, like you usually put some title in here, so I will do that as well. Um, Cloak Acto is a very nice library that helps you to encrypt and decrypt all the data that you have in your database, particularly personal data. That is very sensitive um, if somebody gets access to your database uh, and they read out all the data in there, the personal data particularly, you will pay billions and millions and whatnot in euros and US dollars and whatever your currency is. And because it is so dangerous to store your uh, the personal data of your users as plain text in your database, it is common practice to encrypt the data whenever it is at rest, it's what it's called. So whenever you store the data into the database, it will be encrypted. And whenever you retrieve it from the database, you will decrypt it. And Cloak Actor as a library does all of that for you in a very nice way. So let me just show you how to use it. First of all, um, let's talk about the Cloak Actor library. It's here on GitHub, you can just download it. Um, it has very nice uh, documentation. And apparently it is using underneath the Cloak library, which is an encryption library, that implements several best practices and conveniences for Elixir developers. So these two libraries together um, just help you quickly set up your encryption decryption method for the uh, da data you store in your database. Um, before we dive into the code though, I have also a GitHub repository here uh, where I will store all the code in here for this episode and the, the upcoming episodes as well. So um, if you want to read through the code yourself, go to Peter and Code, well, it's github.com, PJ Ulrich, Peter and Code. And you will find all the code that we discussed today in here. So the, the first thing we need to do is import the library into our project. I set up a very um, basic sample project here, and um, it's a Phoenix project, um, has some Ecto um, implementation as well. And I only have one very simple schema, which is a user's schema. Um, and it has only one field, the email field. And our job now is to take this field and encrypt it every time when we write uh, when we write this field into the database and decrypt it every time when we retrieve it again. So that um, in our the rest of our application, we can simply use the email as is, but whenever we store it to the database, it will be encrypted. In order to do that, the first thing we need to do is import the library. So I will just copy paste this in here uh, underneath the Acto thing. It's Cloak Acto and actually the current version is 1.1.1. So when you do that, of course, you have to get your uh, dependencies again. And that's it. So now um, the first thing we need to do is to create a vault. A vault is um, its own gen server uh, and you can define it to use certain encryption decryption algorithms. So if you have an application, you can define multiple volts and specify each volt which encryption decryption algorithm it should use. So you can use one one volt to encrypt uh, the data in your database and you can use another one to encrypt any data that you want to send to an external user, for example. So this um, so this helps you to uh, use Cloak Acto or the Cloak library um, for different use cases. So the first thing we need to do is to create our own vault as a set. Uh, I will just create in my app folder a new folder called cloak. In here I will just create um, a vault. If you have multiple of course you need to somehow specify what they are for, what the use case is. And um, you can very quickly create a vault by simply using the cloak vault and specifying which OTP app you want to use this one for. So you can also create multiple vaults for different uh, applications if you, for example, have an umbrella application. I believe in my case, the OTP app is simply called app. So this is that. The next thing we need to do is we need to go to the configuration 
and we need to configure this particular vault. I will just copy paste the configuration here. Um, our application is called app, exactly. We just created the app vault and we give it a couple of ciphers. The ciphers are the uh, encryption and decryption algorithms that it will use to encrypt and decrypt your data. So in this case, the only thing I want to give it as a default cipher is the AES algorithm with a GCM mode. If you don't know what this means, I would recommend uh, this particular page. It's called Practical Cryptography for Developers and they have a very nice uh, overview and descriptions of what cipher block modes are, uh, the GCM part we just talked about, um, and what are pop uh, popular symmetric algorithms and whatnot. So um, I will also link to this particular page in the show notes. So the next thing we need to do is we need to generate an encryption key, also called a secret. And we can easily do this by starting a new IEX um, console and just copy pasting a, a command that is in the installation uh, documentation of Cloak Ecto. And it's this. You take 32 random, strongly randomized bytes and you encode them as base64. There we go. The encoding part is very important because sometimes if you create random bytes, you will have some, um, well, you have bytes, of course, but these bytes will represent um, sometimes also some special characters like an ampersand or like a backslash or a question mark. And uh, if you simply code, uh, if you simply copy these special characters into your console, into any environment variables, um, it can happen that your copy pasting, whatever not, uh, functionality or the server or the, the hosting provider, whatnot, they uh, escape, they can escape these um, special characters. So for example, if your, if your um, encryption key would be something like amp um, ampersand, well, that's a percentage, that's an ampersand, there we go, and so on, and an equal sign and a question mark. So if these symbols, for example, are in your um, encryption key, some hosting providers, some servers and so on, uh, start to escape these characters. So then they would always put a, um, a backslash, I think it's called, yeah, in front of it. And this obviously changes the encryption key. So then if you paste this into your server and it, you, you will have a different encryption key. And that's very bad because later on you might not be able to read the data yourself. So long story short, what you have to do is you should well, you should um, encode your random bytes as base64. And we will just do this in this case uh, for development and testing purposes and paste it in here. For production, obviously, you would put this key as an environment variable or secret or something else. So there are different ways of doing that. But yeah, we decode the base64 string here and that is now our encryption key. So with this, we have configured our vault and we can start encrypting, decrypting data with it. So the next thing we need to do is we need to create our own types for the schema. And we can simply do this here and for example call it um, encrypted binary type. We, whoops, create a new module for that. And we have to use um, the types that Cloak Acto give us. So we create a local actor type based on a schema that Cloak Acto gives us. Um, if you want to encode, if you want to create any other types than uh, a binary in the documentation, increase this a bit, in the documentation you will find in the modules uh, section all the different types you can use. So you can encrypt the date, daytime, float, hmac, integer, whatnot, even a map if that's interesting to you. In our case um, we will only use the binary type because um, our uh, string type, the email, yeah, is the only thing we have right now. So in that case, um, the, what we need to do is to create our own local type. So we e easily do this by, for example, doing this. Actually, I won't namespace it. That will over uh, that will maybe um, overlap with the namespace of cloak. So in this case, I will just call it this. And um, to create our own type, we need to uh, use the cloak type, whoops, no, cloak acto binary. And here you can see again all the uh, options you have here. So we do this and we define this type for a particular vault. So again here you can customize your vault and you can customize your types. 
Sometimes you want to encrypt or decrypt a type differently in one vault than in another vault. So for example, you can in some cases always add a prefix um, and in other ones you don't want to add a prefix to whatever you write to the database. So in this case, we will simply use this binary for our vault, which is the app vault. There we go. And we have created our own uh, local type of the binary, of the en encrypted binary. So in order to use this, we go to our user schema and replace the string type with the app encrypted binary type. And this is pretty much everything we need to do because now um, whenever we write the email to the database, Cloak Actor will take that email and encrypt it for us. And whenever we retrieve it from the database, it will decrypt it for us. But before we do this, we need to do two more things. One of them is we actually need to start our vault. So we go into our, in our application um, supervisor, or you can also put it in another supervisor, and you will simply include the vault here so that it, that it gets started whenever we start our application. As I said, the vault is its own gen server. I assume that they decided on doing this um, so that if your vault crashes while encrypting or decrypting any data, it won't affect the rest of your application. And the supervisor will also restart your vault so that uh, you can try to encrypt or decrypt your data again. That's one of the beautiful things about Elixir, to put everything to its own process. So as I said, the first thing we need to do is start our vault. And the second thing we need to do, we need to go into our migration um, for the user and we need to change the string that Phoenix put here by default with a binary. Whoops. There we go. Um, because once you encrypt any string, the email in this case, it will be stored as a binary string to the database and not as a text field. So just put a binary here and we're good to go. All right, now we can test it out. Let's start the project with an interactive IEX console and let's create a user. Whoops. So we just use the accounts context to create a new user with an email address like test.test.com and there we go. We can see that it actually inserted a struct into the user's database, um, which is here, and it inserted as an email a field an actual binary. If this wasn't an encrypted binary, we would see here the string. But um, on the Elixir side, on the, our application side, we create, we receive an a struct, a user struct, which actually has a string email. So whenever we retrieve the user from the database, it will the, the email will be decrypted and will be put as a string again into our user uh, struct. If we look at the database now, we can actually see how the data was stored. So this is the user's table. Let me just refresh it. And we can see that uh, there's a user with the ID too. I tried this before, to be honest, but I cut that out. Uh, but there's a user stored in here and the email is a string of binaries. If, again, this wasn't an encrypted field, we would see the whole string here, the test.test.com string. And if a hacker would get access to the database, they could easily just dump that data and retrieve every email of your, of your customers as a string, as a text. They can just use it right away. But in this case, because it's encrypted, with the AES algorithm, it will be stored as a, as a binary and that is actually the encrypted version of the email. So this way the attackers will have your database, but they cannot use the emails before decrypting that, uh, before decrypting every email. And unless they have your encryption key um, and you use the AES GCM mode, for example, um, it will be very hard for them to decrypt all of the emails. So this way you added another layer of protection of your personal data um, to your application very easily. So um, there's one more problem though, because now you encrypt your email to the database and that means you cannot query against that email. So if you wanted to find a uh, user with a certain email address, you would usually do something like um, repo or repo get by the user and then email email. But in our case, this does not work anymore. This is just a quick test that I wrote. It creates a new email with like some email in here. Uh, sorry, it creates a new user with some email in there uh, and it tries to retrieve it. But if I run this test, I will see 
first some compiling and then that uh, it is um, it is breaking. So it says invalid byte sequence for encoding ETF6, uh, 8. This means, I don't know what this means, but it means that uh, we cannot query against these fields. But there is an easy way to do this. And uh, we need to create a hashed uh, field for that email. So what we do is we create an email hash field, for example, and we make this hash a simple uh, SHA-256 email. Uh, excuse me, SHA-256 hash. Um, if we do this, whenever we create uh, or change or update or insert the email of the user, uh, we will also hash that email and store only the hash in the database and the encrypted email. But by using the hash, we can then, um, if we, for example, want to query for an email, we hash that email first and then only compare the hashes inside the database. And this way we can still uh, query for emails in this case. So what we need to do is we need to um, put that hash of the email inside the change set whenever we create a change set. And for that, we first create a small uh, private function and we call it put hashed fields, which receives the change set. And um, now you can pipe this or you can put it into one function, whatever you prefer. So what we do is um, we put a change into this change set for the email hash and we get the email field over here. And if you then store this change set into the database, Cloak Actor will actually take care of hashing this email um, over here with SHA-256 and only store the SHA-256 um, hash inside the database. That's a lot of hashing to say, but we also need to include this function here. There we go. And now let's give it a try. Oh, before we do uh, give it a try though, we need to create a new migration for that email hash. So let me do this. Actually, I tried this before, but I also cut this out. It's a beauty, beauty of not doing um, live coding. Anyway, so we create a migration um, and we just call it email hash to user, for example. There we go. We go to that and we add it to the um, user schema users and we add the email hash whoops and it is as well a binary because also the hash is stored as a binary in the database so now we um, created the email hash in the database we can try it out again let me do that i will simply start the interactive console again um, and go up a bit and create a user now we see that uh, it inserts stillness of the user database, an email and an email hash. And for the email, it is storing a binary and for the hash as well, but the hash is much smaller. However, if you simply create it and you get this user struct back, don't be misled because this field email hash does not usually hold the plain text email. It usually holds the email hash, but when you, uh, when you do the create user thing, you actually get um, the, um, the struct back that Ecto created from the chain set and not like not the actually retrieved data you get from the database. And to prove that, we can simply do accounts. Ah, oh, sorry, no, uh, let me just use the, the repo. Um, and I will, for example, get the second user out of here. Well, that doesn't make sense because it didn't have an email hash. But in this case, if I get the user, if I retrieve it from the database, um, the user that we just inserted, I can see that the email hash is still a binary because hashing is one way, like chart 256 uh, hashing is one way. And uh, it's very hard or almost impossible. It should be impossible to go back from the hash to the actual plain text. So just keep that in mind whenever you retrieve the struct from the user, then only use the email field and not the hashed field. The hashing fields are only for querying. So um, let's go back to our test over here and um, let's just run it. And we will see that it will not work because we are still querying against the encrypted email field. So now it's comparing the encrypted email field with the plain text email field. And this does not give us a result. So what we need to do as a last step 
is uh, in our context, wherever we have our query method, we need to change the get by email to a get by email hash. And Acto, uh, sorry, Cloak Acto will now take care of everything for you. It will take that plain text email, hash it as a, a SHA-256, and then compare only the email hash with the email hash uh, stored in the database. And now, as a last thing, we will run this, but we will not see that it works. Well, it does work. It retrieves our user from the database. Uh, it has the email that we were querying for, but um, in our test setup, we didn't include the email hash because in here it is uh, that change set and over here it is that hash. But um, we've seen, let me just uh, insert this one now. This should be some email instead of this. There we go. And if we run that test again, we see that it actually works. Just a last note before I wrap up this video. We created an email hash field in our database so that we can query for emails in the database. However, that also has a potentially serious security implication and you have to be aware of that. So when we hash our email and store the email hash in the database, um, we made it easier for attackers to see whether an email is in our database. And that might be good or bad depending on your use case. So what an attacker could do is um, they could take an email or create a random email or maybe they have an email already, hash that with SHA-256 and then compare it to the SHA-256 that we have in our database. Um, that again is, is, depending on your use case, a problematic thing. So if, if you, for example, um, do not want to reveal the fact that a user is, uh, has registered to your, um, to your product, to your service, then this can be problematic. Um, if you don't care about that, well, it's, it's maybe not a problem. But what I want to like um, leave you with is just the, uh, the, the note, the, the recommendation to seriously consider whenever you create such a, such a hashed field. So consider whether you actually need it for querying or whether you just do it out of convenience and you don't, don't actually have like a critical use case depending on it. All right, that has been quite a long video. So let me just quickly wrap up everything. Um, what we have had is a problem that we stored the personal data of our users as plain text in the database. And that means if anybody gets access to the database, they can immediately read out all the personal data of your users. So to solve that problem, we use Cloak Acto to encrypt all the fields that we specify before we write that data to the database. So in the database, we only store encrypted data. And if somebody gets access to that encrypted data and does not have the decryption key, it will be very hard for them to decrypt everything and just read out uh, the personal data of your users. So we added that uh, layer of protection in our application. But to wrap this up, I would like to thank you for staying with me all the time. I hope you could learn something and that you will be able to apply these methods and libraries and whatnot in your own project. Um, I, will, I have some more videos of this lined up. I have some topics picked out already, but if you have any topic that you would like me that you would like me have to discuss, that, I, that you would like me to discuss, I guess, uh, then uh, maybe write in the YouTube comments below here, or I will also link to a thread in the Elixir forum where we can, uh, you can also talk with me. So um, also I would appreciate any feedback on this video on whatever you can criticize because yeah, I want to improve on this. So um, please let me know what you think about this. And uh, well, thank you again for staying with me. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you in the next YouTube video. All right, cheers.